We have tentatively planned uh, to go to the San Antonio Botanical Garden September the 30th. We did make a contribution as reported last month to uh, Michael Eason's project to um, in uh, preserving endangered species and West Texas species. And so we're invited for that. And then the field trip committee is constantly working at ideas and places to go. So, all right. And speaking of places to go and things to do, I got two volunteer uh, opportunities that are promotional events coming up. One of them will be here. Uh, the city is having a water conservation summit. We're gonna give away blue bonnet plugs. Uh, we need help prepping the blue bonnet plugs a couple of days before. We put them in bags and put a sticker with all our information on it so that everybody that gets one knows all about us and how to care for their blue bonnet. And then um, we'll have that day, we'll need uh, people to work at a table and I'm handing out our information and I do not know the hours yet. And I'm been tapped to speak on the subject of drought tolerant native plants for about 20 minutes at that same summit. So if you're interested, if you're online and you're interested, put it in the chat or tell me, make me write it down. Better yet, tell Nancy Copperman back there at the table that you're <laughs> willing to do. Or you may email the website. All right, second volunteer opportunity is the night of our March meeting, okay? Uh, we did this last year. We're supposed to do it in January and give out blue bonnet plugs and it got canceled because of COVID and moved to the end of March. And I know that it was me and Mark Stutzer and we had three or four other people there. It was a huge success. We gave away 300 four inch blue bonnets that were in flower and the kids and adults were thrilled and Fern Bluff was thrilled and they've invited us to come back. This time, it's the wrong time for blue bonnet plugs, but Barbara Wright is gonna grow us something else native that's drought tolerant that we can give out. So there, I need a team that can is willing to go. That meeting, that speaker that night is on uh, invasive species and I'll discuss that in a minute. It is gonna be recorded and she's given permission for us to post it on YouTube. And it's possible that you could get back here before she speaks. <laughs> So if we give out all the plant plugs, then we can go home. So, right. Uh, this is all the information that is on those labels, on those plants that we give out whenever we give out plants. So or Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. Uh, lots of people tell me that they spend lots of time, that are not Native Plant Society members, that they spend lots of time on our website watching our videos you know i could just stay there for days you have so much yes we do so um randy asked me to announce this september of 2021 i believe we had nancy lawson zoom in from the east coast she's the humane gardener she has a blog some of you may subscribe to it but she's got a new book coming out called wildscape and here's a here's a blurb from the uh, uh, book and it's coming out uh, March the 28th I believe but she has really some interesting deep dive scientific data on the interactions between insects and mammals and native plants so there come meeting controls again all right our plant sale I'm going to go ahead and throw this to the top. There. It only, that only bothers us. People online can't see it. But anyway, uh, we're in the Champion Park pavilions. They're adjacent to one another. There's the address. There's the date. We have ordered over 4,000 plants. So come by. That's all right. Y'all buy that much every year. So, okay, upcoming programs next month, we're gonna have the Webbers uh, speaking about native host plants for Texas moths. And they also are going to zoom in. So we'll get our pay cut yet again. <laughs> so, however, 
we're going to have five copies. We're going to give away a signed copy of the book. And we're also going to have five signed copies on hand for you to purchase. So we only have five. So I did go on there today for those of you that have um, abandoned the written word completely. It is available on Amazon in an ebook version for like $8.99. So now I have it with all those nice moth pictures on my phone. Okay. Uh, Ashley Morgan Oliveira is identifying and reporting invasive pests with the TexasInvasive.org. That's the same night we've got that. That's what will be going on uh, the night of the Fern Bluff deal. She's a very good speaker. She was going to zoom in, but she's told us since then she is coming in person. And she comes loaded with TexasInvasive.org swag so that she likes to hand out. So then we have uh, Brian Laughlin on Texas Cacti in April and Ricky Lennox. In May, and I'm telling you now, that one's going to be one hour, but you know, you've heard enough Ricky Lennox to know that it's like a 400 level college class and it's interesting and it's good and it's stuff you didn't know otherwise. So just stop by a little lemon and get you a coffee. Do you know, is Ricky going to be here? I don't know if Ricky's, Ricky may be here. Do we know Susie? Yeah, he might. He likes us. <laughs> We like him. All right. Those of you that are here in person can pick up a free Berman's Red Autumn Sage back there in the four inch. Excellent plant for pollinators and hummingbirds and bees, deer resistant, and uh, just great all around. And you have this sign back there at the back of the room that you can take a picture of if you need some uh, direction on it. Plus, uh, if towards the end of the meeting, there's some left, please take them. All right, uh, chapter meetings. That's kind of our, always take note of the location. As far as I know, uh, we will be here. Um, we're iffy in, is it June and July, Nancy, that I believe we're kind of depending on the library's summer camp program. So we'll notify you of that. And you are being given consent to be videoed for Zoom and YouTube because you're here. And tonight, in-person attendees, one of you will win this book, Bicycling with Butterflies, by our speaker, Sarah Dykeman. And if we're getting, okay, and that's who our speaker is. Uh, I want to tell you, I'm sure she'll tell you, but after the presentation, do check out her webpage, beyondabook.org and see what fabulous stuff she's doing in Mexico with those who live around the monarchs. Okay. And she's coming to us from Mexico. It was in 2017 that she did this, this voyage on her bicycle. And she's been going back ever since. Is she ready? Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And I know that we're all learning as we go with this technology. So feel free to interrupt if something's not working. But um, I'm I am excited to be here. I'm in I'm in Mexico. I'm I'm in the town. If any of if you all have visited the monarchs called Angangueo, which is not where I normally am, but this is the closest internet around. Um, I live in a in a much much more off the grid. Um, it's it's quite a hike to get to, and I barely can send texts, let alone Zoom. So my friend, um, if you follow Journey North at all, which I could talk about. It's like a monarch tracking program. Um, you'll sometimes get updates from Estella Romero who lives in Mexico and I'm, I'm staying at her house. So monarchs connect us in many ways and monarchs are who I'm gonna talk about tonight. So I'm gonna just jump in and share my screen. And I noticed there was a little lag when we were testing and I can't see the screen now. So if I start talking about a picture and you can't see it, don't worry, just wait a moment. But anyway, I have a, millions of photos from my bike tour in 2017. I chose this one to start things off because it is just the perfect example of what my trip was, which was me just going out on a bike and having no idea what I was doing, which is kind of the story of my life, honestly. Same with the book. I started writing a book, not being an author, not having any idea how any of this, the systems of 
publishing work and just sort of winging it and learning so much as I go. And, and the funny thing is the learning process is where all the stories come from. So it's, it was me getting lost and speaking terrible Spanish and learning about the monarch. That's, that's where the stories come from. And, and so it's like surreal that I'm here and amazing. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that I just went out and did it and, and wasn't expecting the result that I have come to, but I am, am glad all the same. And so with that, I've told you maybe two things that are already a surprise. One, I knew nothing about the monarchs really when I started and I didn't know what I was doing. And the, the other thing that I have to tell you, it's, it's kind of the, the saddest of them all, I'm gonna break your all heart maybe, is um, I, I love frogs way more than I love butterflies. <laughs> but this is me working in the mountains in California, studying some of the most incredible animals I think on the planet. Just a little, I gotta brag about the, the frog in the, in the top corner there is a Mount Yellow Lake frog. Their tadpoles take three years to metamorphose. They're so cool. The toad in the middle is one of the few amphibians that is sexually dimorphic. So the males and females look different. This, this is a female. And then these little Pacific tree frogs here are, they're everywhere. They're like the common man's frog and they're my favorite. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about frogs, although I certainly could. I'm here to talk about monarchs. And monarchs are just, they're the most democratic of all species. If you want to save a Yosemite toad, it's, it's all indirect action. It's all fighting climate change. It's all resource, it's all protecting water resources, our um, atmosphere. It's all very indirect things. But the monarch offers us this, this path to like directly help them. Like literally today, you all could go out and buy seeds and sprinkle them in your yard or put them in a potted plant or like a potted planter, put them outside and like you've done something to help them because in the spring, those seeds will, will sprout and the butterflies will come to you. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to buy a plane ticket. You don't have to go to a exotic location. Like literally you just have to go out to your own yard or your own town, wherever that is and look up. And that is something that is just, it is, I think the most profound, profoundly beautiful thing the monarch offers us is that anyone can help them from anywhere as long as they're on the route of the migration. And, and this is the, the basic route. And you'll see it's color coded by season, the range map, and that's because um, they are migrants. So the yellow is where they spend the summer, green is where they are in the spring, Orange is their fall range. And then there's a few tiny uh, blue dots. And there's blue dots in California. So there are monarchs, mostly we call them the Western monarchs that overwinter in, in California. And then there's um, some monarchs that basically get funneled down the Atlantic seaboard into Florida and they stay there. And normally there's a cold spell that will, will freeze and will kill those monarchs with climate change that's changing. So there's potentially, you see there's still a question mark. The Florida population might become something. But most of the monarchs that are that live between the Atlantic Ocean and the Rocky Mountains, they overwinter at this little blue dot. And this is the blue dot where that you like see in the National Geographic um, videos of mil millions, literally millions of monarchs coating the trees. And like I said, when I started, I really wanted to see this. And that's kind of where my, the idea came from was me. First, the idea was like, oh, I'll go visit the monarchs. And then it was like, oh, I'll go bike to visit the monarchs. And then it was like, oh, I'll just bike with the monarchs. And I knew that they went to Mexico and that was pretty much it, but that's really all I needed to know. And so that's what I did. I went to Mexico and I started biking. And this is a, a pretty pixelated photo, but you'll notice there's butterflies. And the very, very beginning of my trip, I was biking with butterflies and there were, it, it felt like I was in a river of wings. It was really, really cool. Um, but then the road turned and the monarchs just kept going into the forest. They don't need roads. <laughs> and I sat there thinking, well, this was dumb. This was, Canada's very, very far away. But I kept going. And in the end, I ended up 
returning to, to the forest about eight and a half months later. Now, one thing I can say for sure is that in this photo, every single one of the monarchs in this photo died before I could return to Mexico that following November. And that's, I think, one of the coolest things about this entire migration is that the monarch migration is multi-generational. So I was leaving with these monarchs, we call them the super generation because they live about eight months and they overwinter in Mexico. They will fly to Texas where they'll lay their eggs and they'll die. Those eggs we call the first generation of the season and those eggs will metamorphose into adults who will immediately about three days after after becoming an adult start mating and they'll only live about a month two to two to six weeks and during that two to six weeks they're mating they're laying eggs and they're continuing the northbound migration that that cycle those shorter lifespans will actually continue on into the summer and then in the fall that super generation will be born where in three days they won't become sexually active um, they'll, it's called sexual diapause, where they basically freeze their, their reproductive development and they fly to Mexico to overwinter. So it can be three to five generations. So this monarch, I potentially saw their, their, their kid, their grandkid, their great grandkid, their great great grandkid. And I mean, it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing to think that a, an insect can go to a forest that their great great grandma went to without a guide without ever having been there before. Um, Cause I could barely do it. Here's my route. <laughs> that, that red line is a 10,201 mile line. I started in Mitchell Con, as I, as I said, where I am now, went up to Canada and back. Before the plan was like, when I first started the plan was literally go north, stop at my parents' house in Kansas city, have a shower and then go back. Like I did not have a plan, but you'll notice lots of squiggles. And that's because while I was biking, word got out that I was going to schools and giving presentations about my trip and adventure and monarchs and science. And reporters would cover, cover my tour and that would be posted on Facebook or other social media or just word of mouth. And I started getting invitations. And my, my goal was always to say yes, because me by myself, I could talk to some people for sure. I could organize a few things. But if someone passionate emailed me and was willing to put in the time and the energy to do the organization like like Susie was for this presentation, like that's gold. And that's the difference between me talking to a handful of people and lots and lots of people. And so if someone had invited me, I tried to say yes. I couldn't always, but I tried. And I was able to not have much of a plan, like I keep saying, because I had everything I needed on my bike. So here's the setup. That's just an old 1989 specialized mountain bike that I have put together many years ago. And the front panniers are store-bought. We call these bags panniers. The back panniers are actually repurposed kitty litter buckets. So you don't need to have the fanciest gear. In fact, it's actually, in my opinion, for traveling, the best gear is the gear that looks old and ratty. So I can park it in front of a grocery store, go in for food, and I don't have to worry that someone wants to steal it because it looks like garbage. So my bike is not garbage. It looks that way. It's all part of the plan. And, and I, I really love this bike. Now here's all the gear kind of spread out. Um, my front panniers had sleeping bag, sleeping pad, computer, journal, notebook, light, when I talked to kids, I would explain that my front panniers were my bedroom and my office. The rear panniers, the kitty litter buckets held um, some tools, basic tools, usually about a day's worth of food. I'd usually stop about once a day to, to buy some food, cooking supplies. The, the red thing on the top here is my tent, my rain gear, warm gear. This bag doubles as um, at night, I stuff my riding outfit into it and it becomes my pillow. And then during the day, my pajamas can go in there to keep them clean. So multi-purpose, two outfits, I have three outfits, sleeping, riding, and pre presenting. So that's the setup. It's very heavy, but that's okay because you just go slow. I would go about 10 miles an hour. I'm trying to cover 60 miles a day. So if you do the math, that's really only six hours of like actual pedaling. 
which give you a lot of time to do other things. And so because of the setup, I just I just had all the freedom I, I needed. So when I was hungry, I just would stop wherever I was and eat. And when I was tired, I was a little more complicated than eating. I would start to look for a place that would be a potential camp spot and eventually try, try and camp when I was tired. Now, I never once paid to camp. People freak out when they hear this. This is my tent and this is somewhere in Texas. There's the highway. Texas has pretty much no public land. And so I had to rely on these easement, these highway easements. I had to rely on hiding in plain sight. Um, in the Midwest, in the Corn Belt, I, I camped behind a lot of churches. And I did this for two reasons. One, I, I don't wanna pay to camp. <laughs> two, I don't wanna plan a trip and have to arrive somewhere every day. It would be so stressful to say, oh, I gotta pedal 80 miles today to, the, to get to this camp spot. And I'd have, I'd have to go where the camp spots are rather than where I wanted to go. And the third is like really the call to attention what all travelers need, which is a camp spot every night. And that's what the monarchs need. They need every single night a place to sleep and they need every single day a place to refuel, get their food, lay their eggs. They're not gonna get that, especially in Texas by aiming for national parks and wildlife refuges. There's just not enough. So the way that we're gonna make sure that every monarch that arrives in Texas has enough, has, has a place to stay, has what they need, is if every roadside becomes their habitat, if every yard becomes their habitat, if every parking lot and church and golf course, if, the, if we find habitat everywhere for them. And Texas is so important to the migration because when those monarchs arrive, that first generation, they're looking for milkweed to lay their eggs, which I talk about in a second here. In case you don't know, milkweed is the only food source of the monarch caterpillar and they'll lay their eggs if they can find lots and lots of milkweed in Texas, then they're gonna have a very successful first generation, which is just gonna boost the population for the whole season. If they do poor in Texas and Oklahoma in the spring, and whether that's because of drought, whether that's because of habitat loss, because of a freak storm that pushes them north and so they just aren't in Texas, whatever the reason, if they, if they do well in Texas, they'll do well the whole year, pretty much. That's kind of how it's been. So we really, really, really need to jumpstart the population in the spring. And then in the fall, we need to make sure that when they're traveling through, they, milkweed isn't as important, but those nectar, the nectar producing flower or plant. So any native plant that blooms in the fall is so crucial. I just rode my motorcycle through Texas and I fell in love. I already was in love with goldenrod, but um, all those mist flowers, I, I, I don't know all the names very well, but the mist flowers, the bone set, like they were just covered in monarchs because the monarchs are fueling up in Texas, well, on their whole route, but especially in Texas, they're trying to get as fat as possible because they're here in Mexico right now, not eating. So if they arrive too skinny, they starve to death here. So the goal is for them to arrive fat so they can hang from the trees, basically do nothing all winter and then fly back to Texas on those fat reserves to lay their eggs. I've gotten way off track. I was talking about camping, but here we are. But I, I think it's just important to remember monarchs as travelers. And my trip added that humanity of like, oh yeah, of course, every, we can't just protect Mexico. We can't just protect Canada. We've got to protect everywhere in between. So that's how I operated on my bike tour. The other great thing about that I've mentioned about having freedom is I was free whenever I wanted to stop. And my book was about, and my trip was about monarchs, but it wasn't. It was about all the animals that I came across. This little toadlet wins cutest award. Very cute. Um, most beautiful, in my opinion, rough green snake. Yeah, this is in Missouri. Snakes, especially, man, they get such a bad rap. And I think that there's, I think if you look at our culture and what, how we, how we react to wild plants and animals, you can see especially in, in snakes. We're just so scared of the unknown. This rough green snake could not hurt you if they wanted to. Just like having a wild yard that looks a little, a little messy or a little weedy is, is, looks scary, but it's not, it's actually really beautiful. And if you get to know them, you'll get to know those yards, know the plants, know the animals in those yards then you'll be offered beauty and 
and in all sorts of ways. And so I think the snake really just epitomizes that, that relationship that our culture has with wilderness that we have to shed. We've got to get rid of it. We have to, sh we have to change what scares us. And it shouldn't be a snake. It shouldn't be a, a weedy looking lawn. It should, it should be a, a mowed lawn that's getting watered during a drought. So most beautiful. Here's actually the scariest animal of the trip. I need not say more. I didn't get sprayed. It would have been a good story, but I didn't. And the other great thing about my bike tour, because I'm on, because I'm vulnerable, because I'm going slow and people can see me and I don't have walls around me, I get stopped not not just by snakes and skunks, but by people all the time, every day. And I'm an introvert. I'll admit when I first first I heard this guy coming down the road. This was in, in northern Texas, or excuse me, northern Mexico, and it was hot, and I was tired and bored. And I see, the, or I hear this motorcycle, and then I and I notice that as they're getting closer, they're they're slowing down, or he's slowing down. And I just remember being like, I'm gonna pretend I don't see him, because I just didn't want to talk to him. I just wanted to get where I was going. But he stopped, and I said, okay, you can do this. And then he was like, hey, do you want ice cream? I was like, oh yeah, I do want ice cream. And so I, I actually try, try to say yes to these invitations because that's where the story is. I don't remember a mile before or a mile after, but I remember this man and his ice cream. And so I'm, I'm grateful that I stopped. And it, it wasn't just roadside ice cream. I stayed with eight, 86 families, I wanna say, on my tour. A lot of them were strangers. Some still are strangers, like they were on vacation. And so I just showed up at their house and then I left and I never met them. But I put this picture with, of Margaret because again, it, it kind of shows the connection I had to the monarch that was more profound than just, we were on the same route. Because in the foreground, I show up at Margaret's house. She's a dairy farmer in Canada. And she says, hey, do you want homemade ice cream from my dairy cows? And I said, yes. But in the background, the monarchs are showing up to her backyard and she's offering them an invitation too. And so that, that's her backyard. And so again, like I know exactly what it's like to receive hospitality. And we have to give that hospitality, not just to human travelers, but to our, our animal, other animal, where humans are animals, our insect travelers and our bird travelers and and I call them our, our more than human neighbors. So we need to extend those invitations. Let's see. Oh, so I was giving this presentation a lot during my trip. And one day a woman came up to me like about to cry because she thought no one had offered me ice cream in the US because I just talked about ice cream in Mexico, ice cream in Canada. It's okay, I got ice cream everywhere. So I had to pick an ice cream story from the US and I picked this one. That's Erica and Lynn. I met them at a sanctuary in Mexico. They were just traveling like I was and we traveled together for a day. And then they said, oh, we live in New York City. And I said, oh, really? I'm gonna bike to New York City. And they said, yeah, give us a holler when you, when you get there and you can stay with us. And I think they were thinking, no way are you gonna bike here? So I'll, we'll just offer. But lo and behold, like three months later or four months later, I call up Erica and I'm like, I'm here. And so Erica hosted me on the, I don't know, the edge there, the left or right. I don't know what your screen is looking like. And then Lynn took us in the middle, took us out for lunch. And then afterwards she's like, you gotta get, we gotta get ice cream and a fish. And again, like that say yes rule, you gotta say yes. So I said, okay, ice cream and a fish. And luckily this was it. This, this is a stolen photo, but it's like a Japanese craze with these like soft shell cones. And if I hadn't said yes, if I hadn't been on this trip, I would never have known that this ice cream existed. And so it's just all, all of these opportunities come from like taking that first leap and, and from giving your energy to, to something you're passionate about. So lots of ice cream. Um, monarchs don't need ice cream, they need milkweed. So I've mentioned milkweed a few times. If there is no milkweed, there's no monarchs. That's just as simple as it is. So on my trip, it was as much about milkweed as it was monarchs. Milkweed's the only species uh, or the only plant host for the monarch caterpillars. There's there's many species in North America, About I think about 70 something species in North America. 
there's some common ones that everyone talks about. Some favorites, it really varies per region. My recommendation is always put a, put a few in the ground and the, the species, they'll tell you which ones wanna live in your exact spot because they'll be the ones that survive. But anyway, I was biking down this road looking for milkweed, which is what I did six hours a day uh, on my trip. And then I saw, I don't know if you've noticed the caterpillar on this milkweed here, I'm gonna zoom in. I saw this caterpillar, threw my bike down, explored this roadside ditch, noticed this really cool behavior where this caterpillar was grabbing their poo, which we call frass and throwing their poo over the leaf. And I just was like watching this and I'm gonna back up. This is like a foot from it, some just random highway in Indiana or something. Like people don't travel here to see these phenomenon happening, but maybe we should because really interesting things are happening just in our own yards, in our own sides of the roads. And it, it just takes, takes noticing, takes slowing down. The problem with stopping and noticing is you fall in love with these creatures. I call monarchs gateway bugs because you start with monarchs and then you love the spiders and, and the ants and all, all the whole food web. But with that love comes like, comes at least came for me a lot of pain because I'd be biking down the road and I'd see this, this habitat. I would imagine all the, the fifth in stars. I would imagine the grandparents having survived an epic migration, survived to Texas, one of their 500 eggs survived the predators of Texas. They're in like, it, this, the cycle continued only to get mowed down. And it was just like, so heartbreaking. And people expected me to show up just like, I love butterflies. And no, I showed up so mad, so much of the time. I was so angry. And people always imagine that the hardest part of my trip was like pills. It wasn't. I would take pills any day over this feeling of dread of watching humans destroy the planet without a thought. And I was so mad. And I wrote the book because I was mad. <clears throat> and of course, if I had just been mad, and I, well, I guess first I'll say I had a lot of reason to be mad. Everywhere you walk, <clears throat> excuse me, everywhere you walk today, yesterday, the day before, that was all monarchs land. We have stolen so much of the monarch's land. And we gotta, we've got to start giving it back. We have to start sharing. And I would look, you know, it's one thing to have a little yard in your front yard to have a picnic or play fetch or catch, but so much of the grass I was seeing was, was just that. It was just grass for nothing, for nothing. And it's like, wait, that was, that's the monarch's land. And I know everyone here probably has grass because they wanna be a quote, good neighbor. And just as I mentioned before, we have to be, we have to think about our more than human neighbors. So what's it gonna to take to be a good neighbor to our bird neighbors and our frog neighbors? It's not grass, I can tell you that, it's natives. And we need them because if we don't, we're gonna lose this, this, this migration. And this is a graph of the monarch population. You'll notice it goes up and down, but if you kind of squint, you'll see it, it, the trend is down and down is scary. And it's not getting better and it's not gonna get better until we get milkweed in the ground. And I've included this graph because there's this dotted green line. And this is the line that we need the population to be for them to be sustainable. And you can see we haven't reached that line in almost two decades. And so it could be one freak storm kills 80% like it has in the past. If you, only, if you start out with a sustainable level over this, this is it's six hectares, which basically means that's how much area of the forest in Mexico is covered in monarchs. It's like 2.4 um, acres per hectare. So you need a certain amount so that if there's a freak storm in the winter that kills 80%, you still have some left over to repopulate in the spring. Or if there's a drought in Texas in the fall and there's not very much good nectar out there and they arrive skinny, a lot starve, there'll still be enough to manage that repopulation. Without that, one of these storms, one of these droughts is gonna be the end. So we really need to get to, to that line. And the way we get there is by planting 1.8 billion stems of milkweed, 1.8 billion. And the reason the number is so high is one, there's lots and lots of monarchs, but two, because the monarch 
their, their migration patterns shift year to year. So maybe one year they're more to the east, one year more to the west. We can't just have the perfect corridor ready for them. No, we need to, we need to have lots and lots of corridors ready for, for, for every scenario. So 1.8 million stems of milkweed. And like just saying all this, like I can feel my heart rate going up and I'm like talking faster and louder. And, and so my trip and my book and even these presentations are just about finding the balance between my, my desperation and my anger and my hope. And I believe we need both. I believe if you are not angry, you have your eyes closed and you have got to be angry that we have taken the possibility of a kid in a hundred years looking at a milkweed on the side of the road and thinking, wow, maybe I saw their great, great grandma four months earlier. Like we're robbing the future of that, of that amazing moment. And we should be angry about that, but we also have to have hope. So on my trip, I, had, I found hope in two ways. First was giving presentations, using my voice to talk to the monarch, talk for the monarchs. I spoke to about 9,000 people on my trip. And the book is an extension of that. It's just me yelling at the top of my lungs. That we gotta notice, we gotta pay attention, we gotta share. And the other thing I did was just surround myself by people who care. So I visited so many schools with passionate, amazing teachers and parents doing amazing things like putting gardens in the ground so that kids can have these firsthand experiences with nature. So if you live near a school and you want a passion project, go start talking to admin. It is a hard job, way harder than biking 10,000 miles, I, I will say, but go for it. We need you. Um, I met scientists. This is Dr. Chip Taylor, who started Monarch Watch 30 years ago. He's in his 80s now, by the way, still, still working. And, you know, one of the things that, like, I didn't really even quite understand, but with that, by the way, there's, that's a monarch on his face, on his forehead there, if you're wondering. But people are always like, oh, youth give, or like, the, the kids, they give me so much hope. And I'm like, no, no. It is our job to give young people hope, not the other way around. And so I look to, to people that have been on the ground fighting for me and for, for, the, for the future. And that's where I find my hope. And so I'm just, I'm so, so grateful for Chip and his team and, and all the people that are older than me that had been fighting. Because I, I truly believe that if they hadn't started this fight, there wouldn't be a monarch left to fight for. So I'm, I'm trying to carry the torch. Um, I also met farmers. This is the Neemans in Junction, Texas. I don't know how far y'all are from, from Junction, but we'll, we'll go Native American Seed Farm. You can buy seeds from them. Bill is, his whole family was amazing, but I got a tour from Bill and I got to hear a story. And basically he started with non-native landscaping in the eighties. And during some phenomenal drought, he would notice on his way home that there would be fields with green blush life. And he thought, well, how are all these plants dying in front of our home, in front of these homes, but they're in these fields doing fine. And that was his, the, the first really realization that natives are important and natives are worthy. And he started great, or I don't wanna say rearing, he started growing those, those natives and now he harvests the seeds and sells them. And like, it's such an awesome story of, of, of changing. And it's like, man, if a farmer can change, if my dad, my dad has milkweed in his yard, if he can change, then like, this is not hopeless. Speaking of um, hope, <clears throat> this is a golf course. If we can get monarchs and golf courses, then there's just no excuse. So this is the rough this is in Missouri. It saves hundreds of dollars a year on maintenance, mowing. It looks beautiful and it's habitat. And it's again, an example of sharing. Here's a parking lot. Again, it's a parking lot. The monarchs don't need a lot. They just, they need something. And so we can offer them that. And of course we can offer them our yards. This is a small little garden, but in Oklahoma. But when I passed through, there were already 40 eggs. If one of those eggs survives, that could be 500 in the next generation, 500 eggs that is, that could be thousands of eggs. That could be the difference between you all seeing a monarch 
or not one particular day. And so every garden matters. And again, we can share. There can still be ornamentals. There can still be a patio. I'm not saying we have to get rid of every speck of grass, but we, we got to get rid of some to share. And if you want to go big, please go big. This is Nadia in Columbia, Missouri. I included this photo. One, her front yard was spectacular. Don't hide your natives in the backyard, get them in the front yard because we need to show the world another, another way. We need to be that example. And Nadia was that example. Because of her example, here's some milkweed. I asked her about this milkweed growing in her neighbor's yard. And she said, they used to mow everything. And then they learned that if there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs. So now they mow around this milkweed. And that's what we need. We need a Nadia on every street being that example. Re thinking what beauty is and showing our neighbors another way. Here's another house. This is in Joplin, Missouri, uh, Val's garden. There's a monarch. Wow, it works. And I visited Val on my bike tour and on my motorcycle trip. And I took this photo just a few months ago. We were looking at her, her garden. Um, this is uh, called, the common name is butterfly weed. And I, I spotted two monarchs and there's their, their chrysalis. They had just declosed, so they were just waiting to, to take off, to launch. They'd probably hang around for a few days before starting their migration. And maybe I've seen them since, which is so cool. But I just like, I think it's so important to pause here and emphasize if Val had a, just had grass, this monarch would not exist. This monarch owes their entire existence to Val's decisions. And that's a lot of power and a lot of responsibility, but it's also really beautiful that we can make such a difference. And maybe this monarch will come in the spring to one of your yards and lay, well, that's, that's a male, but maybe a, a, his, his offspring will, will survive in your yard because of you. And God, it's just, it's, I think I said beautiful too much. I'll switch to another word. And I'm gonna look at the time. It looks like I'm still doing okay. I wanna have time for questions. So be thinking about questions if you have some. Um, let's see. Ah, oh, I talked about golf courses and parking lots. The, the ultimate proof that it does not matter where you live or who you are, if you're rich or poor, Democrat, Republican, any of that is I was just, I had finished I my visit with- us did the butterfly migration. She actually- um, I was visit I just finished talking to Erica and I'm biking over the Brooklyn Bridge and I get to Manhattan and I am like thrilled to be leaving. I'm not a city person. And I spot this monarch and I'm like, I gotta stop. And I chase this monarch down the street like a wild person. Um, caught or not, I didn't catch. I, I took a photo and I just like, yes, I have proof. Like it does not matter where you live. There's no excuse. Get that. Get those plants in the ground. If you plant it, they will come, as they say. And the beautiful thing is like, I'm like preaching about how we need to get native plants in the ground, but it, it's, it's not like I'm asking for people to do something that will not re offer anything in return. And I think one of the, the my, my favorite parts of my tour is that I have, I have learned that the more I give to the monarch, the more they give to me. So I gave them my time and my energy, my voice, my money, my, my life, quite honestly, at this point. And they have given me beauty. I mean, that's, that's beautiful. This is the butterfly weed in bloom. And this is a male because they have, or he has these, these scent pouches on his back wings. And so males, the milkweed is not just a, a food source for caterpillars, but it is a good nectar source for, for monarchs as well. But they give you beauty. They give you like, like little like secrets. Like because of my trip, I learned about these milkweed tussock moths that also eat milkweed. And rather than developing aposematic coloring, which means a warning coloring as an adult to tell predators that the milkweed was toxic, that they sequestered those toxins in their body and that they are now toxic. These uh, milkweed tussock moths have aposematic sound because they're adult, as adults, they're nocturnal. So being bright orange would not warn anyone. So they actually have a clicking sound, a special organ that clicks to warn predators. That to me is a gift. To know that that has, exists in the world I, is, is a gift. 
And I've mentioned before, monarchs are gateway bugs. So they, they kind of, they become our teachers and they gift us the, this insight into like all the teeny tiny creatures in our yards that are important, including the predators. I know a lot of folks um, say to me, oh, like what's, I, I saved 10 monarchs, I reared 10 monarchs in cages. And my feeling on rearing, which is raising caterpillars, uh, monarchs and, and cages is raise a few that way so that you can watch the process so that you can share the process with your neighbors and the kids down the street and the school down the street and the library on the street and to help create those connections. But I think it's important to remember that that's not how we save the monarchs. A female will lay 400 eggs. 95% of those eggs will get eaten by spiders and ants and wasps and beetles and that's okay because we need these animals to feed the birds that we love and the frogs that we love. And so the way that we save the monarch is by offering the, each female 500 milkweeds so that she can successfully lay 400 so she doesn't have to dump those eggs. We call it dump egg dumping when she has to put too many eggs on one milkweed because there's not enough milkweed. If we can offer her enough milkweeds, then we can offer them the possibility of a few surviving, which would double the population. Even if just four of 400 survived, that would double the population. They also offer me the gift of helping frogs. Like uh, this was a little froglet on some common milkweed um, that when I was looking for eggs. So if milk monarchs aren't your thing, if, if plants, if you love plants or if there's a, a moth or a bird or a spider or a frog that you love, like give that animal your, your time and your energy and your love and your vote. And like in return, you'll be helping monarchs. It's ever, we're all connected. And they'll give you friendships. Like I have hundreds of friends. I mean, I, I, and certainly thousands of relationships because of the monarch. And what, this one in particular is, a, is one of my favorites. This is Brianda. This, I, she was my first guide when I visited the monarchs. Uh, fast forward a few years and I'm attending her wedding. I still live with her mom when I visit. There's my bike in the background. And what a gift, the, the monarch. I've, like, I, I give the monarch credit for this, for this friendship. And they give me this also important reminder that, that small is big. So this is what the monarchs look like in Mexico. And you'll notice there's one tree here. It's a small tree, but there's enough monarchs on this tree that the branch is bending from their weight. One monarch cannot bend a branch, thousands can. And I, so I think about that when I look at a small garden or when I'm you know, doing a presentation to, to a room full of, I mean, sometimes I've talked to five people and I think, what is the point of this? But then I remind myself or the monarchs remind me, I should say that, as small as big and like if we all do a little that that equals a lot so really we just got to get those milkweeds in the ground and i'm gonna full disclosure the first milkweed i planted uh died that's okay there's a steep learning curve but you all have a community and you can turn those adventures into good stories and you can you can help each other and lean on each other and and learn from each other and, and learn from your mistakes and Keep, keep trying. My, the milkweed that I've planted since has done better. Um, but if you do, the, the true adventures will come to you and they'll, they'll lead you on, on so many interesting paths and to, to meet friends and, and learn things. And so just, just follow, follow them, follow the plants, follow the monarchs. And I, before I close out, I wanna just share two adventures that I'm on with the monarchs right now. And I, let's see, my internet, the internet here is, well, let's see if I can. This is what Monarch streaming looks like. Wow. And you'll notice that they're all flying directionally. And this is what they do on, on warm days, especially in the spring and fall, is they will leave their colony and they'll fly. And they'll fly out of the protected forest and they'll fly into to where people live. Um, and I have been training women. I currently, right now, since November, 12 women have been counting monarchs for me three times a day from their house. And at each house, this is, this is one example of, of counting. Um, I have a couple more. As they count, we use very high-tech gear. This is a old tent of mine that I cut into 
the pieces and they hold that out to measure wind, wind speed and wind direction. And then we use paper um, and notebooks and pencils and watches <laughs> to keep track of things. But with this information and along with these weather, these, if you look in the background here of, of this Albertina's house, um, I've installed these weather stations and they're collecting data every minute and I can pair their data to the counts. And um, basically my goal is threefold. One is to, to produce data on this phenomenon that has never been studied include women in the study and I'm paying them, it's not much, but I'm, I'm paying them each about $10 a week, which is good money, especially if you have to stay home and you can't go to a city to, to make money um, if you have your, to take care of your family. And then I'm also just encouraging these women to, to be scientists and have a very wild job. And it's such a pleasure when I show up to a house and they're, oh, there was, the monarchs were doing this weird thing today. And it's like, they're noticing and they're creating these connections and that's that's where conservation starts. So this is an adventure, it's, it's very, very hard, but I'm trekking along. And then my other adventure is continues to be my book. I put this picture up because uh, a paperback version will be out in, in, Feb in February and on it, the cover's a little different, but it shows that I won an award and I have a quote from Dr. Jane Goodall both I consider gifts from the monarchs. And I included this picture because I'm currently working, I'm, I've gone through draft number two of a, a 10 year old version of my book. So stay tuned for that. 10 year olds was my favorite audience to talk to. And so I, I wanna write a book for them. So hopefully I didn't talk too long. If I did, I apologize. Um, I got a lot to say. <laughs> But I'll close with my screen, and if there's questions, I'm happy to answer them. Let's see, and I can, I don't know if I should read through the chat to. Do we have any questions in the room? I'll have to repeat them for her. Does she have a degree in biology? Do you have a degree in biology or anything? Yeah, I have a degree in wildlife conservation from a college in California. Explains the frog thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm waiting to hear, I'm waiting to hear about, I was laughing with some friends. My last, my longest job I've ever had, I'm 37 or 38, I'm 38. My longest job I've ever had was in high school. Um, and I'm, I'm waiting to hear about a, a more permanent job in California with frogs. They've, they've been postponing their decision for quite a while, but I want it. And at the same time, I'm terrified, but I told them I can guarantee two years. And after that, I don't know if I can commit to more. So. We have a question. Um, how far do the monarchs fly in a day? How far do the monarchs fly? There have been records of monarchs flying very, very far. I mean, I don't want to say a number and get it wrong. It's in, it's in my book, but a couple hundred miles. I think it's usually much, much less than that. It depends too on the time of year and their motivation. In the spring, or excuse me, in the fall, they're trying to get as fast as they can to Mexico before the freezes come. So they're they're very determined and they'll they'll go for it by the summer and they if, if a monarch is born in this in the north in the summer they have everything they need they've got milkweed they have a good temperature they don't fly hardly anywhere um as a as a whole i can tell you the spring migration advances about 60 miles a day which when i read that i just thought that's so perfect because that's about what a, a bicyclist can do um and then of course it's wind they'll they'll go high up to catch wind um I, when i first started i thought oh if i'm following monarchs i'll always have a tailwind that's not true but yeah there's a lot of factors kind of affect affect their their distance but the other thing that i guess just the last thing to mention other than that is one they no one really knows but about one hectare of monarchs will have between like 20 and 50 million butterflies so if there's 
even just a few hectares, that's hundreds of millions of monarchs. So pinning down anything, like it's kind of actually brilliant because I can just say, well, normally, but when you're talking about a million, you, you can get a lot of different answers in there. So you can say almost anything and be right. For one, one of those butterflies is gonna make you right. <laughs> A question from Cindy Davis. She says, um, were you working with an agency that paid you to take this trip? No, I was on my own. I, I started out knowing I could do this trip for next to nothing. It doesn't cost much to bike, bike tour. Um, what, as I was biking, people started giving me donations. And that, so by the end, I, I think I broke even on my trip. And then my butterfly, my butterfly research I'm doing now is, is uh, Monarch Watch has helped me out, and I've I've done, I've gotten donations. I have a, I have a GoFundMe up if if you want to pitch in as well. Um, Quick house question. What is the peak time in Michoacan for all the monarchs to be there? In your peak time in Michoacan for the monarchs to be there. I mean, I I rushed to get here, but I got here on like October 27th or something. Mm -hmm. And I, cause I wanted to see the first monarchs come through and I got people counting monarchs. I, I had started my project in 2020. So I had some some veterans that could, could start the process. I didn't need to train them as much. And we all started seeing monarchs right around November 2nd, which is the day of the dead. So I was actually in a cemetery and one of the like the folklore of the indigenous wisdom is that the monarchs are the souls of our ancestors come to visit. And so it's like pretty, you're pretty speechless when you're visiting a cemetery and you see your first monarch of the season. But they'll be here from November till usually about the end of March. If you come in December, it's supposed to be cold. Climate change is just wrecked havoc on on a lot of things and as, as far as my observations have my observations have told me but um in december they're mostly just hanging from the trees conserving their fat reserves i love when they're hanging from the trees not flying because i'm like oh you're you're saving your energy uh and then in february that and well december at this point they'll start being more active and flying around so most tourists like to come usually um late late December to, to early March, mid-March. Um, a question from Stacy Olson on Zoom, is habitat loss the greatest threat for monarchs? Short term, yes. If there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs. If there's no nectar, there's no monarchs. They're, I mean, riding my motorcycle through Texas was shocking this fall, because I biked it in 2017, and I thought there was a lot of development then. <laughs> it's just like, it's so fast, it's happening so fast. And you know, like Iowa used to be where the monarchs were, and now it's all corn. And it's like 0.01% of remnant prairie remains in Iowa, 0.01%. So the monarchs are making do. Luckily monarchs, again, they can thrive in a parking lot or a golf course. So there's still opportunity and there's still hope, but yeah, habitat right now is of the essence. And then, but of course, climate change. So the, mon the monarchs, I'm, my house here is at 10,000 feet. The monarchs are a little bit higher than that. That's the perfect temperature for it to be not too hot, not too cold as the climate changes the, the weather or the climate here, the, the trees are literally not gonna be able to survive the warming climate. And so you'll have tree, which is what's happened. These OML fir trees, they used to cover all of Mexico after the last ice age. And then as the climate warmed, slower and more naturally, the, 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 the only forest that could survive were the forest at higher elevations that was cooler. So every, whatever, millennia, it was higher, higher up. And so now they're just on the top of these mountains, but there's nowhere left to go. So eventually, in, in the next hundred years, I, I think we're slated to lose ninety percent of the of the OML fir forest. So that's a, a bigger challenge. But there's if we, if we start sequestering carbon now, 
today, we can we can slow that down and, and possibly even reverse it. So there's hope, but we gotta we gotta act, we gotta vote, we gotta spend our money wisely, use our voices wisely, our power wisely. And uh, Betsy Bixby asked on Zoom, what's the best resource for monarch planting strategy? Probably the best resource is all the folks at, alongside you. Um, I really like the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center website. You can type in the height of a plant that you want. If you say, I want a plant that blooms in the fall, that, has, that likes clay soil or rocky soil, that's moderate shade, and they'll give you a list of, of plants more suitable, a good starting spot. There's lots of um, native plant sales where you'll meet folks. I mean, you all are native plant people. I should let you all answer this question. The only other thing I would mention would be that, um, I, I lost my train of thought, best strategy. Oh, um, Monarch Joint Venture also has really good information on like really bite-sized like PDF form on, on planting that are, that are a really good place to start too. But if, if someone wants to jump in for a more local answer, please do. I have uh, 75 one gallon pearl milkweed vines ordered for the plant sale. So <laughs> April the, the, price will, the price will just go up. <laughs> I mean, if you want to get rich, plant we milkweed. We don't, uh, we don't charge extra for milkweed. <laughs> Very much. Right extra. now, I guess the, the I'm a, I'm hesitant. I'm a little scared to talk about like Texas is always a little a little different, but so please interrupt me. Different as far as planting wise, like because it's like a, a little bit mellower. Um, I my experience has been that the answer anyway. Just tell me if this isn't true. But for me right now, if you're interested in getting those milkweeds in the ground, is go buy seeds. Try and get as most the most local you can. So if someone in the group has milkweed seeds that they collected off their plants, that's a good place to start. Native American seed farm, that's a good place to start. And then put them outside. I, I, my strategy is put them in like little tiny planter boxes or like what those little plastic things plants come in and just put them outside. They'll, they'll overwinter. They need to overwinter. They need to experience cold and moist conditions to know that spring has sprung. And then the great thing is if you use potting soil, you'll know what the milkweed is as opposed to if you sprinkle them in your yard because every plant, at least to me, looks the same when they're one inch tall. But you'll know it's a milkweed. You can let them get a little bit bigger. You can pass out a few to friends and then you can put the ones exactly where you want in your yard. And you, and you could do that now. There's a question from Amy Picard. Is visiting Michoacan detrimental to the overwintering monarchs? Like, are the tourists having a negative impact? They're definitely, I should say, we are having a, a negative impact, but they're having less of a negative impact than offering the local people no other opportunity to make money, and so they cut down the forest. And so that's really where tourism is. That's, that's the goal, is to arrive to a place where the forest can give jobs to local people here without having to cut down the forest. So all of this land was given to the Mexican people uh, after the last revolution. And it's, it's public land, it's federally owned, but it was given to them as a way to make money. And then when the monarchs were, quote, discovered, uh, the government said, nope, never mind, you can't use this to make money. And all the local people were like, oh, what? Like, this is our livelihood. And so there's always been a bit of a clash. And the way we get rid of that clash is by offering jobs and offering jobs, not just as guides, but of course, all the infrastructure that, that tourism creates. And there's ways to do that, I think, more ethically than not. Um, but it certainly is a struggle. And it's, you know, I, I I don't go ever on a weekend. It breaks my heart a little. And they'll, El Rosario, where I'm at, will will see thousands of tourists on one on one day on the weekend. Um, 
but at the same time, that this is this is how we make connections. So there's no easy answer. Um, but I think I think the good outweighs the bad. That's it. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was fantastic. We feel like we're with you there. And we're going to work on getting more milkweed in the ground up here in Texas and more nectar stuff on the in the ground. So Perfect. Do our well, part. I, I appreciate it. I saw I saw a few more questions. If you're really really curious, you can you can reach out to me on my website. And I my internet's terrible, and I'm right now terrible at replying, but I'll get to it eventually. But okay. yeah, everybody go tell someone, and we'll we'll tell everyone, and we'll. We'll make this happen. So thanks, thanks for for caring. Anyone that showed up tonight cares, and that's so crucial. Thanks. Take a pause here. <laughs> well, thank you. Now I'm going to shut off my computer and have to switch to Spanish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like a bit of a slap in the face to right. make this switch. But yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for organizing this and. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.